Welcome back to Connected Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Connected Rheumatology is a rheumatology practice based out of Dallas, Texas. Our mission is to provide well-rounded, holistic rheumatology care, and one of the ways we do that is through education. So our channel, the Connected Rheumatology YouTube channel, is meant to do just that. Here we talk about all things related to rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it is all connected. If that is something that you're into, make sure you subscribe to this channel, make sure to share it with anyone and everyone you think might also be interested in this information as that really helps us get the word out. Now this is the last full week of May and if you've been following along with us, you'll know that we have been talking all things lupus in celebration of Lupus Awareness Month. You know, I have a very special place in my heart for lupus. Lupus was one of the first conditions I came across that really made me fall in love with the field of rheumatology and I have had the honor of taking care of hundreds of lupus patients. In fact, I was kind of wondering if it had, if it had broken thousands. It might have broken thousands, but maybe just barely but i've really had the honor of taking care of a lot of lupus patients of being involved in one of the premier lupus clinics in the country and being able to teach future rheumatologists all about lupus so i really love lupus <laughs> um, so what we're going to talk about today is related to what i think a lot of us have had our eyes open to within the past year. So obviously this is no surprise, but the last year has been tough. And we have had our eyes opened in ways that we probably could never have imagined. And I'm speaking not only about COVID and the pandemic and the change of our day-to-day -day lives, but specifically to the events of last summer. One of the ideas that I keep coming back to, especially after the events of last summer, is that in order to really call yourself a lupologist, which, yes, is what people who take care of lupus call themselves, you also have to support Black Lives Matter. And so that's what we're going to be getting into today, race and lupus. Let me just be the first person to say I am not a Black Lives Matter expert. Like many of us, I have had to do my own reading, my own listening, and my own learning to fully understand the history and the mission behind the movement. And I am still learning, but I do know lupus. I know all about what happens to the body of those with lupus. I know how to identify it. I know how to treat it. And I also know who gets it. Now, in part two of my two-part series about the top 10 things you should know about lupus, which if you haven't seen, I recommend going back and watching because it's a good one. And I'll put the link to both of those videos in the description box. I discuss how it tends to be a disease of young women. But if you were paying attention, you will notice that I really didn't discuss how race impacts lupus and the differences we see amongst different racial groups. The truth is that one in every 250 black women have lupus and the prevalence is three to four times higher in black communities. Not only is it more common, but lupus within the black community tends to occur at an earlier age and it tends to be more severe. Specifically, kidney and heart problems are seen three to four times more in black lupus patients compared to white lupus patients, and the mortality is higher. And these differences aren't changing. From 1968 to 2013, we have had substantial improvement in our ability to identify and to treat lupus. Lupus-related deaths have decreased by 33% within the white population but only 13% within the black community. So despite the advances we've made, not every community is benefiting from those advances equally. So why is this? It's a natural question. 
Well, there are a lot of thoughts and theories, and one of the areas of research has really focused on socioeconomic factors. And when we talk about socioeconomic factors, we're talking about level of education, type of jobs, the type of neighborhoods that people live in, all of that is, is kind of under the umbrella of socioeconomic factors. And so that has been studied pretty extensively. So what we do know is that if there is a lack of access to health care, if a community has higher rates of air and water pollution or lower availability of a diverse food choices, then they tend to have worse lupus outcomes and those characteristics tend to be higher in communities of color. That may very well explain the differences we're seeing in severity and rates and mortality of lupus. But does it explain everything? Another area of research they've been looking at is into genetics. So the question is perhaps maybe there's a gene or there is a group of genes that predisposes someone to have a worse case or more severe case of lupus. And in fact, they have found this to be true. And there have been genes identified that put someone at higher risk of developing kidney disease. Now, genetic studies as a whole are very important as they will inevitably lead to a better understanding of a disease as a whole. But I get wary when we place too much emphasis on the genetics of a condition. One is it tends to overemphasize the importance of a gene in the way a disease shows itself. And two, it takes the environmental context of where that gene is living out of the discussion, which we know we can't do. Being overly focused on the genetics of any condition tends to lend itself to just throwing up your hands and being like, oh well, it's in the genes, and allows us to be blissfully unaware and unmotivated to make any larger societal changes that we need to make in order to help public health. So when discussing genetics and the importance of genetics, it is very reasonable to then ask, well, what is the experience of black populations around the world? And what we see is that the black community in the UK has very similar numbers to what we see in America. And interestingly, the numbers in Africa are very different and not as severe and certainly not as prevalent. Now, we are far from understanding all of this and if anything, it really just highlights how much more research we need. You know, the medical systems within Africa are not as robust and it is not as easy to study incidence and prevalence of any disease there in Africa. When comparing numbers, Right now, the numbers that are being compared are numbers that come out of parts of Africa that actually have the infrastructure in place to study it. And that tends to be Eastern and Southern Africa. However, African Americans, for the most part, are descendants from West Africa, where we don't have nearly as much data. So you can see here how it is, we do need a lot of research. Right now, we are comparing apples to oranges and we can't make any assumptions. So then this leads to a growing area of research that I think is very important, not only in lupus, but in all chronic disease. And that is the research looking at the impact of racial discrimination itself on chronic disease. The murder of George Floyd last year opened up all of our eyes to the systemic and the ingrained injustices that are built into the system in which we live every day. It is impossible to look at the medical conditions in which we know have higher prevalence within the black community without also evaluating how they may or may not be impacted by this environmental context that we now can't ignore. So I wanna talk a little bit about this notion of allostatic load. It's been around since the 1990s and depending on how old you, how old you are, you might think that was a long time ago. It seems, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. <laughs> Allostatic load is loosely a term that is defined by the body's wear and tear as we get older, as we collect experiences in our life. The idea is that there are certain 
measurable biologic markers that when taken together give us a picture of the cumulative effect of a person's experiences. So the markers that they look at are markers associated with the hypoth hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system or the neuroendocrine system and this is basically the system of hormones that interact with our brain and the rest of our nervous system and basically regulate and control everything. It is looking at our immune system and these are markers looking at metabolism. So, so far, the research has really focused on evaluating the allostatic load in conditions in which we know people have higher rates of acute and, sh and chronic stress. So, for example, we know that adverse chi childhood experiences as well as racial discrimination have been associated with high levels of stress. And what they wanted to see was, do they also, do those same patients who have high stress from these particular experiences, do they also exhibit changes in their allostatic load that is measurable in their blood with these markers? So it's not just someone saying, oh, I'm really stressed. It's looking at their blood and looking at these particular markers and being able to see if they go up or down based on the experience. And spoiler alert, both adverse childhood experiences and racial discrimination have been associated with higher allostatic load. Now we also know that high allostatic load has been correlated or associated with several chronic conditions including heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Now what does this have to do with lupus? Well. I don't know just yet. There is no hard data linking allostatic load and lupus, but I do think it's coming. And it does provide a bit of a framework when we evaluate the data that has come out. And that is data showing that racial discrimination is associated with worse lupus outcomes. Studies are showing that even if you control for socioeconomic status, meaning everyone's education is the same, everyone's jobs are the same, and everyone lives in similar neighborhoods. That when you control for that, racial discrimination itself is associated with poor outcomes in lupus. So we know that patients exposed to racial discrimination have higher rates of organ damage, as well as higher rates of inflammation biomarkers within their blood that we know is associated with lupus activity. Now, there's a lot to tease out here, and I am not a social scientist, um, so when reading this literature, there's a lot of statistics and a lot of modeling that I really have to dig into because a lot of it just goes right over my head. But, you know, how does education and family ties and social connections, whether it be in school or in church, how do these things interact with the racial discrimination effect, these are things that we don't know. But I do think it'll be interesting to see as research moves forward, especially research that's combining the social sciences and the biomedical sciences of this interplay between how a person lives and the culture in which the person lives and how that may or may not affect their chronic condition. As a rheumatologist, it's my job to identify and treat autoimmune diseases of all kinds. And I have a number of tools at my disposal to do that. Tools like x-rays and CTs and labs and MRIs and my colleagues and my physical exam and then medications. But one of the other tools also is my voice. Now, lupus is by far not the only reason to be supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement, but in honor of Lupus Awareness Month, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that these two topics, these two issues are connected. And I'm hoping that more scientists and more researchers who are a heck of a lot smarter than I am see that link and start to do the studies necessary to better understand it. Thanks so much for watching. I'd love to hear your ideas and your thoughts about this topic. This is an idea that's been rattling around in the back of my head for a while and was very interested to dig into the science and the research that's been done. I personally find the intersection between social sciences and the biomedical sciences fascinating. I think that, you know, 
as I always say, everything is connected and we cannot separate ourselves from our environment. And I'm very interested in understanding more about how our environment impacts internally, what goes on inside, both when it comes to health and when it comes to disease. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure you share it with anyone and everyone you think might benefit from it. Um, if you like more about, uh, blah, 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 blah. If you like to hear more about rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness, make sure you subscribe because that's what we talk about here. And uh, you know, it's all connected.